Thank you so much, Patrick, for the, the introduction and to all for being here. Patrick and Fabian as well for the, the organization of this Congress. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, as I was telling Patrick, I was here exactly a decade ago doing research for uh, this book at the IOC. And it's, it's amazing to see uh, the, the energy here in Lausanne and in particular around this university. So I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, so as I begin my talk today, I, I want to set the scene. Today, the Alpine nations of Europe count over 20 million skiers among them. And beyond that, 120 million tourists visit the Alps every year. And obviously, tens of millions of these come from beyond the Alps and indeed even countries that, that border on the Alps, uh, with visitors from every continent flocking to Alpine stations. Together, they take over half a billion rides on ski lifts every year. Winter tourism, anchored by skiing, obviously, is an industry. We need to think of it as an industry. And it's one that anchors economic life at the very center of Europe. Excuse me, I have a pop-up here. This map up here shows the various ski areas of the Alps. It's probably difficult to see. Uh, but each of these red dots, excuse me, sorry. Each of these red dots represents a, a resort or ski station. So I think it, it shows, as you likely know, the, the industrial nature of skiing in the Alps. And at the core of this industry is a real paradox. Skiing has colonized the Alps, transforming societies and landscapes to suit the particular mode of production that makes up this industry of tourism, of sport. And yet the sport and this industry of alpine skiing are sustained by the environment, by the society, and by the culture of the Alps. Critics often conceive of this relationship between skiing and the Alps as that of a parasite and host, with the industry in some way leeching the life force of the natural environment of the Alps. But I think this approach misapprehends the true nature of the relationship, and in fact the historical nature of the relationship, and in some ways it can only perpetuate in action. For can we expect this lucrative and multinational industry to simply exit the Alps, even with its various problems? What I wish to show today through historical example is a remarkable stability of the relationship between skiing and the Alps. And this is a relationship that is not parasitic, or we might say not parasitic alone, but in many ways symbiotic. Alpine communities and landscapes sustain the sport, and the sport in turn sustains alpine communities. The question though is, what next? How can this relationship be maintained in an era of climate change? And is there such a thing as a sustainable form of alpine skiing, or is that simply an oxymoron? Is there no such thing? But this is the end point of the story that I want to tell, and I'll return to some of these issues by the end of this talk. To truly understand the stakes demands a historical perspective. How did we get here? Skiing arrived to the mountains of Central Europe around 1880. At this time, the Alps were described as a periphery, one that was located, ironically, at Europe's very heart. And you can see here in this uh, iconic piece of art from Franz Marc uh, showing the poverty of the area of Tyrol in Austria. On the other hand, skiing before this point was largely a Scandinavian practice. And European models of modernity and politics describe Northern Europe as what we would call developing, right? Not as backwards as Eastern Europe, but certainly not as advanced as Central and Western Europe. So by the time skiing arrives in the Alps in 1880, separately taken, both skiing and the Alps were understood to be peripheral and even primitive in many terms. And these understandings help us to see how skiers must have understood the sport and the winter landscape in the late 19th century. Take, for example, a very famous early skier, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Like many of his British countrymen, he was very, quite taken by the idea of wintering in the mountains that he found so enticing in the summer. In the winter of 1894 and 1895, thanks to a, a particularly uh, poor health of his wife, who was suffering from tuberculosis, he takes up residence in Davos. Conan Doyle, while there, wanted to entertain himself, and he describes skis as a deceptively simple tool that held great power. And in fact, they take the usual fear and loathing of the mountains in winter, and it turned them on their head. Summiting a peak or traversing a mountain pass in winter was in fact far easier, it seemed, than taking that same trip during the summer. And the ability to glide downhill and the crisp mountain air made physical exertion much more pleasant than in the warm summer as well. Conan Doyle, in a very famous article he wrote in 1895 in a British magazine, described a day trip from his hotel in Davos to the village of Arosa over the intermediate peaks of the Plesser Alps, a distance that he estimated at some 12 to 14 miles. Him and his party left in the early morning and arrived before lunch, making the distance in only seven hours. 
At the turn of the century, skiing offered this allure of a seemingly primitive practice in an unforgiving landscape that was austerely beautiful. Skiing was, in this case, an act of discovery, of communion with the landscape, which had its basis in a romantic appreciation of nature in the 19th century. But at the same time, it was also an act of conquest, of exploration, rendering previously impenetrable landscapes and dangerous journeys simple and even enjoyable. And so we should not minimize the power of skis in this case. Even today, assuming good weather and no traffic, the shortest road route between Davos and Arosa is 84 kilometers and takes nearly two hours to traverse by automobile. And so the power of the ski remains even more than 100 years after the fact. I think Conan Doyle's description of skiing is remarkable for its timelessness. The allure of skiing seems to transcend historical eras. As one commentator wrote in the 1960s, skiing is the joy of the mountains multiplied by the joy of speed. There's a synergy here that remains a constant in the sport, the individual's physical and mental experience of movement in the mountains. What has changed, obviously, is the infrastructure and the services that exist to support this experience. So the question is why and how. Sorry, I keep getting this pop-up trying to get me to sign in for the internet here. Early skiing enthusiasts from across Europe argued that the skis would transform mountain life. Early skiers described them as the perfect tool for integrating backward mountain people, quote-unquote backward, into the modern world by giving them greater freedom of movement. Lowland skiers' condescension for mountain dwellers in this era before World War I was significant. As the French skiing pioneer Jules Payot described them, quote, sedentary, breathing contaminated air, they led a life that smelled musty, analogous in, its, in certain remote villages to hibernation. But the skis exercise the evil spirits of the snow. The ski is liberating. It affords an enormous extension of liberty to the mountain dwellers and has more importance for the future of the Chamonix Valley than 30 ministerial changes could, end quote. Freedom of movement, skiers at this time argued, would connect mountain dwellers to the civilized world and bring them progress, draw them into the modern world. The greatest impact of skiing, though, was more indirect and perhaps accidental than advocates had predicted. It was less mountain dwellers skiing to get between villages or to uh, engage in traditional economic activity, uh, but it was much more in its potential to be weaponized for the service industry. Many Alpine residents saw in skiing the potential for a new vocation, and adapted their activities to benefit economically from the growth of winter tourism. The presence of summer crowds and alpine leisure, summer, excuse me, alpine leisure centers had already given rise to a service economy by the late 19th century. Many of the so-called legacy winter stations that remain influential today, like Chamonix, Davos, Saint Moritz, benefited from being well-established summer destinations of the 19th century. Managers of hotels lobbied railway companies to establish more regular winter service between lowland urban areas and the mountains. In 1900, Davos and St. Moritz welcomed seven trains daily bearing visitors from far-flung metropolises like London, Paris, and Munich. When Chamonix hoteliers learned of this in 1908, they were lagging behind. They quickly lobbied the paris lyon méditerranée railway to supplement their current schedule, which saw only three trains each week. Indeed, some of the most iconic advertisements for early winter sport, the sorts of things you see in chalets uh, back in, in my home in California and Colorado, uh, were produced by railway companies. Hoteliers also invested in heating and plumbing that would make staying over the winter more pleasant for their guests. They forged relationships with medical doctors to treat patients, such as Conan Doyle's wife, suffering from respiratory ailments or more general malaise. And they also advertised quite widely, recognizing, as all good capitalists do, that they had to invent new needs among potential consumers. They can't assume that people will want to ski. They have to convince them that they want to ski. The results were remarkable in a very short time. Over the period between 1899 and 1913, the number of overnight visitors in St. Moritz grew 700% in the winter. And they stayed an astounding 240,000 nights in the last winter before World War I began. From this early point, a key fact about alpine skiing became clear. This was a profoundly simple sport. Two planks of wood lashed to the feet, a staff or two sticks used to aid in balance and turning. This was all that was needed to enjoy the sport's unique mix of nature and speed. But the sport also provided seemingly, seemingly limitless potential for related goods and services, as this profusion of advertisements uh, from before 1930 shows. Equipment, clothing, hotels, railways, 
Each of these stood to benefit and profit directly from the popularity of the sport, as did locals who provided goods and services to tourists. And so we should not fall into the trap of believing that skiing had some golden age of pure, unadulterated contact with nature, uh, before it's somehow corrupted by capitalism and tourism. That relationship between skiing, capitalism, and tourism has been there from the very beginning. And the sport has always depended on its relationship to the mountain landscape, on the one hand, and its relationship to mass culture and capitalism at the same time. We might think of this again as the relationship between the joy of the mountain multiplied by the joys of speed, of modernity. What has changed, obviously, is the volume of skiers and the intensity of the interventions into the landscape. But that underlying dynamic has remained quite consistent. By World War I, Europeans had come to associate skiing with modernity, with adventure, and with luxury. Although the popularity of the sport had increased massively in the wake of the First World War, not all skiers viewed the democratization of the sport as a universal positive. From the beginning, there had exi existed some deep ethical tensions in skiing. It was an individualist experience, one that was almost religious for many people, the communion of man and nature in the sport. But it also had these deep materialist, capitalist, and industrial potentials that led various parties to exploit the sport for their own gain. And the growth of the sport had significant effects on the alpine landscape from the very beginning. Sorry, let me close this again. These are nicely summarized in this 1913 cartoon from the German satirical magazine Simplicissimus. The cartoon, once and now or then and now, shows a wintry mountain in its so-called natural state before the arrival of skiers. You can see untouched snow, birds. But the second panel shows the same mountain. In this case, a monochromatic and faceless horde has driven away all the birds, the snow has been scarred by ski tracks, and it is covered with trash. This points to a timeless tension in the sport, and one that is not merely a product of the post-World War II growth in the sport. The relationship to nature obviously lays at the very core of alpine skiing, but that relationship is quite fragile. The better access to the mountains that was provided by infrastructure and services made it easier to practice the sport, but also increased the pressures on the mountain environment exponentially. This timeless tension, though, should not obscure the real changes that have occurred in the relationship between skiers and their landscape. The interwar period between 1918 and 1939 is a real inflection point in the history of skiing. And once again, images from mass culture can help us to understand the tensions in the sport and its relationship with the mountain landscape. Here we see a 1931 piece of art uh, by the Austrian artist Alphonse Walda, Aufstieg der Skifahrer, The Climb. In the foreground, skiers climb the hill, with the majestic peaks of the Tyrolean Alps frame, framing the background. We might term this vision immediately romantic. We see courageous, virile men skiing through a sublime alpine landscape, seemingly devoid of human influence. Their faces obscured by shadows, and they are dwarfed by the massive scale of the Alps. As we might imagine, this vision appealed to many in interwar Europe, given the historical context. On the one hand, the mountains provided an escape from the crowded and polluted cities into the purity of nature. In contrast, the skier finds both revivifying physical activity and spiritual contemplation in the Alps, reuniting mind, body, and spirit that had been alienated over the course of the early 20th century. Although such attitudes were already popular before 1914, after World War I, the carnage of that war led many to seek respite in nature. Not to mention the fact that thousands of men across Europe had received ski training to protect alpine frontiers, and many of them tried on skiing during the war and found it fit, becoming leisure skiers in the 1920s. Another reason people turned to skiing is that in the mountains, the social problems of the modern city and modern life gave way to this comradeship of the skier, who found that the combination of sport and nature strengthened social bonds that had been strained by urbanization and industrialization. Placed in these contexts, Valda's painting suggests that the combination of bodily movement and nature appreciation in interwar skiing was understood as both an escape from the modern world and a return to nature. But this source is also not so one-dimensional in its meaning. There's an underlying tension and question here, which is, are these skiers communing with nature, or are they conquering nature? Although they're framed by sublime alpine peaks, our focus is immediately drawn to the skiers at the front of the frame here. They reach the crest of the hill thanks to their skis, a triumph of technological ingenuity and, and sort of man's ingenuity over snow and slope. 
Further, they're wearing short sleeve shirts in winter, mocking the extreme climate of the Austrian Alps. And they work up a sweat, but they do so purely for pleasure and will return to their warm chalets and hotels before night closes in. As this painting suggests, skiing communicates contradictory messages, and it communicates these messages often simultaneously. And these tensions, I think quite strikingly, actually accentuate the popularity of the sport because it could be all things to all people. It could appeal to nature enthusiasts, people who want to get back to nature, and it could also appeal to those who are in it for the speed, uh, the conquest, the heroism. And so this piece of art by Valda illustrates how the sport could combine the romantic return to nature and the sense of mastery in a single frame. If this paradox of communing with nature and mastering it was timeless, the 20s and 30s saw the new fusion of the sport and mass culture. Although companies advertised skiing goods and services at the turn of the century, the interwar period saw an explosion of skiing-centric marketing. All of this marketing had depended on the cachet of skiing, with its unique blend of nature and modern culture. But whereas earlier eras had seen the direct marketing of skiing goods and services, hotels to ski at, for example, in the interwar era, we start to see the use of skiing imagery used to sell other goods, basically sort of cashing in on the cachet of skiing in the 1920s. For example, this 1925 Mercedes-Benz advertisement proclaimed skiers and drivers alike to be master over space and time. Whereas the sport had once been the province of only the elite who could decamp to mountain stations for weeks at a time, it had now become part of the language of mass culture. But again, there's another paradox here. It symbolizes luxury. This is being used to sell a Mercedes-Benz in 1925. And so there's this, this mix of the sort of the democratization uh, and the universality of the sport while also maintaining these elite associations. It becomes associated with modern fashion and consumerism, and this often called upon female figures uh, to make these associations. Uh, we really see in the 1920s an association between skiing and the so-called new woman aesthetic, uh, independent, sporty, uh, and so these things become tightly intertwined in the 1920s. And I think this becomes even more visible in the intersection of skiing and film. Skiers had long had difficulty explaining the appeal of their sport in words, or in depicting it in still photographs. So these static media had a, a, a lot of difficulty sort of showing people what the sport was like, particularly those who lived in European cities uh, who might be interested in the sport but might not understand what it looked like or felt like. And so this dynamic medium of film emerges as an offshoot, excuse me, it, it promises to more authentically uh, sort of demonstrate the appeal of skiing. And so in the 20s and 30s, we start to see skiing films emerge. Uh, and they, they emerge from that very popular Berg film genre of uh, German film, German cinema. The famed director Arnold Funk and his star skier Hannes Schneider collaborated on a number of ski films. The most popular of these was a film called Der Weiße Rausch, White Ecstasy, which starred none other than a young Leni Riefenstahl, who you see here, before her unfortunate partnership with Hitler and the Nazi party. This film is essentially an action comedy, and it ends with an elaborate ski chase where Schneider and Riefenstahl flee dozens of pursuers. Throughout the chase, uh, we see Riefenstahl grinning with pleasure, the, the ecstasy of the title, and the director keeps the camera held in tight on the skiers, on his stars. Despite the striking scenery surrounding Arlberg in the Austrian Alps, the mountains are no more than a real backdrop for the action in this film. We're really focused on the sport itself and on the stars, the celebrities. Funk uses rapid cuts, dramatic angles, and ski-mounted cameras to depict the unique experience of alpine skiing for many people for the first time in this more dynamic medium. Within this film, it is the skiers and not the mountains that are the focus. So there's, again, this tension between the sport of skiing and the mountains that it depends on. But in the late 1930s, skiing is ubiquitous in European mass culture. Its appeal was well known throughout Europe, even among those who had never tried the sport, such as Benito Mussolini. In 1937, the fascist regime circulated a photo of Mussolini posing shirtless on a ski outing. This image is meant to highlight his masculinity and associates the dictator with the sport's values of mastery, conquest, and speed. You might notice here, no skis. Right? So he's just standing near skis. And Mussolini was, by all accounts, a lousy skier. And so what these images indicate is that from advertising and entertainment to politics, skiing becomes a part of the cultural vernacular in the 1920s and 1930s and has these associations and meanings that all people can point to in this time period. <laughs> 
At this point, you might be wondering why I'm offering a lecture on skiing and the environment that has lingered for so long on the representations of skiing in mass culture. This is because the penetration of skiing into culture in the interwar years had two major effects. First, the marriage between skiing and mass culture both stimulates and responds to the explosive growth in the practice of the sport. By 1936, alpine skiing events are contested at the Olympics for the first time. And races in Garmisch-Partenkirchen attract tens of thousands of spectators. I mean, people are just shocked by the number of people who are interested in watching these. There are great images uh, from the, the sort of um, the press in this time period of people who have climbed up in the trees to watch these events because they simply can't see there's such a crowd there. When World War II broke out, the Swiss Ski Federation had 30,000 members, the German and Austrian Combined Federation had 100,000, and the French over 20,000. And on top of this, many hundreds of thousands more skied without actually joining those national clubs. So if the Simplicissimus artist had lamented the befouled mountains of uh, the Alps in 1910, the intervening 30 years had raised the environmental impact by many orders of magnitude. Secondly here, while skiers still flocked to local mountains and iconic resorts and often made the relationship with nature a major focus of their skiing, the depictions of the sport in mass culture generally divorced it from specific landscapes. Many of those images I showed a few moments ago use the abstract imagery of skiing to symbolize luxury, power, and the modern. You can see this similarly in an advertisement for the Italian National Tourism Agency in 1930 for the German market, which focuses on the skier at the expense of the landscape. The argument here is to come ski in Italy, not for any particular Italian landscape or resort, but because skiing in Italy is speed, masculinity, modernity, right? Um, so it doesn't matter if you're going to Cervinia, if you're going to um, any other Italian resort, this is the experience, right? It is really abstracted from a specific landscape. And so this combination of democratizing the sport and downplaying nature in cultural depictions alters the practice of the sport and its relationship to natural landscapes in ways that are really going to pay off after 1945. And so rather than being the major appeal of skiing for many people, mountains are transformed as a kind of abstract stage for speed, luxury, and bourgeois culture in the popular mindset. Also happening in this time period, technological impacts of the sport are really rising in the 1920s and 1930s. Skiing was a sport that had long been dependent on technological innovations, railways, improved bindings, equipment innovations. But things really changed in the 1920s with the construction of the first cable lifts, which began to proliferate in the 1930s. The relationship to the environment undergoes a critical shift with lifts. And the mountains really become cultivated landscapes, engineered to suit the specific and particular needs of alpine skiers and those who provide for them, for their needs for speed, for ease of access and safety. And so this romantic vision of a sublime, empty landscape collides with the capitalist logic of maximizing profits by recruiting more skiers. In the early 1930s, the French lift developer Charles Villard argued that the recipe for successful ski areas in the Alps was clear, saying, quote, all had been created for skiers in the form of cable cars, funiculars, and transport installations that, in eliminating the fatigue of reascent, permitted easier access to the snowfields at high altitude." End quote. This strategy fundamentally changed skiers' relationships to the mountains, to the benefit of business interests, and to many skiers themselves. The lifts attracted skiers to the resort, and the resort could stay open longer because lifts connected skiers to higher altitudes where the snow cover began earlier in the fall and lasted later into the spring. Here we see just one example of this. This is a map uh, relatively recent of Cervinia, Broy. And as you can see here, there's a really tight sort of urban style uh, density here. And then the important thing is that it's connected to this massive series of lifts, which can even take you over to the Swiss side, right? Uh, that you are going to basically stay in this one contained spot and then be able to ski uh, a far larger area than people had before. So legacy resorts like Grindelwald, San Moritz, et cetera, used old infrastructure that had long ferried summer tourists to panoramic vistas. But in the 1930s, France and Italy, where alpine tourism, even in the summer, had long flagged the Eastern Alps of Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, they recognized that by installing these kinds of lift networks, they could create popular winter sport stations out of thin air. Cable lifts are quicker and cheaper to construct than funicular railways, 
and they are well suited to skiers' desire to ascend the mountain quickly in order to descend it on skis even more rapidly. The signal example of this lies almost directly to our south, in Sestriere, Italy. Sestriere is the first successful winter station created solely to serve the needs of alpine skiers. It was built from the ground up in 1934 under the direction of Giovanni Agnelli, head of Fiat Automobiles. This new alpine station benefited from the extension of the Autostrada from Torino, a purpose-built train station, and the construction of three lifts that allowed skiers to access 74 distinct downhill runs. This new resort combines ease of access, convenience for urban dwellers, and a variety of skiing opportunities for skiers of varied ability. And this is so important. I think that we can't minimize this. The way that having 74 distinct runs and lifts means that you don't have to be a world-class alpine skier to enjoy skiing for a weekend or for an Easter holiday. This project by Agnelli is qualitatively different than other stations, uh, which were really pre-existing villages that were divided among numerous owners. Jump ahead here just to show you what this looks like. Here you see Grindelwald, right? One of these sort of legacy stations. And you can see the way that over the course of, of centuries, Grindelwald has sort of expanded out of the valley. You can see all these small black dots are essentially buildings. And so as time goes on in the more modern area, you can see that there are some lifts and funiculars that have been built. Um, but this is a very diffuse area, right? Whereas something like Cervinia has this much more compact model, right? And so by creating Sestriere from the ground up to serve skiers and to capitalize on their business, Agnelli brings lifts, accommodations, transport, and entertainment under centralized ownership for the first time in a previously uninhabited landscape. So they don't have to worry about buying up land or property from other people, right? They can just build this thing from the ground up. Given the popularity of the sport and the belief of practitioners that it was a necessary prescription for the stresses in the modern world, this expanded access was a good thing. And I think this is something that we have to recognize from the vantage point of 2020, which is that more people skiing was an obvious good to basically the vast majority of society in this time period. It was seen as a good thing to get more people skiing, more people out into nature, more people engaging in physical activity. After the disruption of World War II, and the economic and political shifts that it occasioned, investment in skiing infrastructure grew rapidly. For example, the Austrian government invested over 93 million shillings worth of European Recovery Program, or Marshall Plan funds, in the construction of ski lifts between 1950 and 1955, as the government sought to position itself as a global destination for winter tourism. And here's just some figures of the number of lifts operating in both Austria and in France uh, between the end of World War II and the mid-1980s. And you can see this rapid construction, uh, this explosive growth in the use of lifts. The environmental effects of these developments work to the advantage of both producers and consumers of skiing. For winter stations and businesses in alpine villages, lifts made explicit the spatial boundaries of alpine skiing, allowing producers to monetize the sport more effectively. Again, to return to this map of Grindelwald, in the era before lifts, skiers would take to the hills surrounding established alpine villages wherever they liked, and they would wander, wander excuse me, the mountain landscape until they grew tired and returned to their hotel or chalet for the evening. But ski lifts have the effect of enclosing alpine space and rendering it an object of capitalist consumption, monetizing the mountains in explicit terms, as Agnelli had, had really recognized in a quite visionary way. As that example of Cesriere illustrates, a lift could transform what they called snow deserts into ski paradises, supporting hotels, restaurants, and other services, and really becoming a boon for tourism interests and the national economy as a whole. And so this effect is, is massive in terms of the economy of the Alps and indeed the nations uh, that the Alps exist within. Lifts transported 10 million passengers annually by 1972, and by the end of the 20th century, that number had climbed to over 500 million, as I mentioned at the outset. You can see here, uh, very similar to, to Broy or Chavinia of uh, Royaz, with this, this very sort of modernist, dense model. I mean, these are, these are massive, multi-story apartment buildings, right? Condo buildings, um, which are meant to, to take advantage of these sort of small footprints of a, an urban kind of infrastructure and then connect to this much larger lift infrastructure. For the skiers themselves, lifts made the sport more attractive by clarifying the accepted landscapes of alpine skiing and by removing some of the mental and physical barriers to practicing the sport. 
Here we see teen. Uh, and these are mapped by difficulty, as you likely know uh, from skiing. You have various routes or, or pistes being defined by, by color, by shape, the sort of infamous black diamond or double black diamond, right? Um, these are ways of saying which landscapes are, are suited to various types of skiers, right? Um, but we all know that we would not be afraid to take my five-year-old daughter out skiing and to, to put some skis on her and to put her on the bunny hill and let her have fun, right? Um, so this is what this kind of enclosure of alpine space in the building of lifts allows to happen. It makes it so that we deem it safe and suitable for people of all ages, abilities, genders, et cetera. And so the construction of lifts not only sped the ascent of the mountain, but it also sanctioned certain spaces, declaring them fit for consumption by alpine skiers. The massive investments in infrastructure implied that the landscape was safe and suited for the sport. Further, the presence of state-certified ski instructors and meticulously groomed, excuse me, meticulously groomed runs delineated by skill level, suggests that it's a sport for all ages and ranges of experience. By eliminating the need for a taxing uphill climb, lifts made the sport considerably easier to practice and more alluring to those who might have otherwise avoided the sport. And so we need to think of lifts transforming ski runs into the equivalent of highways, right? On highways, drivers enjoy freedom, they control their motion, but that motion is bounded and channeled by infrastructure and by rules, right? And this is what's happening on these ski pistes in the post-World War II era. And the effects of this are truly massive. An enthusiastic skier before, say, 1940, might have experienced an altitude change of some 10,000 meters and traveled the distance of 50 kilometers in a single season, single winter, before the construction of ski lifts. With the aid of lifts in the post-war era, a competent skier can experience similar altitude change and similar distance in a single long day of skiing. Right? So the amount of effect they're having on the landscape is really rising in this time period. Lifts make leisure skiing more accessible. Uh, and, and I think that we could wonder whether it means it makes it more affordable. I think there's, there's a sort of uh, contemporary rise in, in people's economic standing at the same time, which means that uh, the relative price of skiing services seems to go down, if not uh, in real terms. The management of ski runs for leisure and for competitive skiing alike increased the safety and the reliability of the sport while improving athletic performance, making the sport much more attuned for an age of television. Technologies remade the Alps to suit alpine skiing, but despite those technological modifications to the landscape, the sport remained entirely dependent on the mountains, as we will see. Lifts and terrain modification were fundamentally about the management of alpine space to make the sport more safe and more widely accessible. This improves access and improves, allows for uh, the further democratization of the sport. If alpine skiing was made possible by mountains and snow, it's little wonder that the other major form of intervention after World War II was the manipulation of snow itself. Snow is both a, a blessing and a curse for the post-war ski industry, because snow alone is not enough to guarantee or maintain profitability. It needs to fall in the right places, at the right times, in order to sustain the massive investments in infrastructure and the service sector uh, that the sport depends on. The technological manipulation and the eventual production of snow made the practice of alpine skiing more reliable for consumers and producers alike. And it also cushioned skiers and tourism interests against the vagaries of natural conditions. To be profitable, skiing had to be both accessible and safe. And so the investments in the alpine landscape multiplied in the post-war era, and the technological ability to affect the landscape really increased at the same time. As a result, state officials, private business interests, began to engineer the alpine landscape to minimize the risk of avalanches in the interest of protecting investments and human lives. Resort operators and state officials employed both offensive and defensive strategies to manage the destructive power of snow and the mountains. In many ways, the alpine landscape comes to resemble a war zone. Resort operators employed these tank-like groomers of the snow to pack it down and in so doing to increase the instabilities that could trigger avalanches. Armies used explosives dropped from helicopters or fired by mortar or by cannon to trigger small preventative avalanches where people could avoid them rather than having a destructive and catastrophic avalanche on a resort or at a ski competition. But I think it's really the defensive approaches to avalanche management that made the alpine landscape look like a battlefield 
Resort operators erected snow fences and avalanche buffer walls to channel and arrest the flow of avalanches in order to protect skiers and investments in infrastructure. The buffer walls represent tank traps, uh, which would not have been out of place on a World War II battlefield. And the fear of avalanches, as we can see here, leads to coordinated efforts to manage the landscape and diffuse its immense destructive potential. While these tactics help protect human life and valuable infrastructure, a far more intractable threat endangers the economic security of the ski industry, and that is the availability of snow. Without snow, a warm winter can create an economic catastrophe on par of, with what a harvest failure had been a century before, right? Um, I had notes written up on this, uh, and then I arrive and I'm sitting at the train station having a coffee yesterday morning, and what do I see in the local paper uh, but exactly what it is we're talking about here, right? The, the movement of snow uh, to assure the practice of the sport uh, for the very games that we're here to be involved with. And this is nothing new. The most dramatic example of this occurs in 1964 in advance of the Innsbruck Winter Olympics. In early January of that year, the president of the Austrian Olympic Committee faced an impossible dilemma when he saw this out his window in January. Green mountains. And so unlike the regulated ice rinks of hockey or skiing, skiing events are at the mercy of natural conditions. And so on the last days of 1963, the Austrian Executive Committee for the Olympics voted to implement emergency measures for the preparation of the skiing courses outside Innsbruck. Beginning on January 9th, Hundreds of army reservists transported snow to the competition sites uh, from 40 kilometers away. Nearly 1,000 men worked for three weeks to load trucks with snow and distribute it over these alpine skiing courses, moving in eventually over 15,000 cubic meters of snow over the course of three weeks. This came to be known colloquially as the miracle of Innsbruck, a logistical feat that assured the success of the games and more generally, it epitomizes a significant post-war shift in the relationship between skiers and the Alps. And so although this begins as a kind of improvised reaction to an environmental problem, in fact, it produces a racing uh, track that is better suited to alpine skiing competitions than natural snow was, at least according to the organizers. The Austrians have been able to build these pieces literally from the ground up, creating ideal courses of uncommon uniformity and security. And as you likely know, skiing is one of these sports that is very difficult to adjudicate based on our sort of modern conceptions of sport in which every person participating has uh, the same conditions and the same opportunity, right? Uh, when one goes in a day, uh, whether you're the first skier or the 20th skier has a huge effect on the, the conditions of the ski course, right? Um, so these kind of from the ground up built pieces uh, are much more effective in creating a, a sort of generalized field of competition, it seems. And so this example suggests that the increasing popularity and profitability of the sport over the course of the 20th century did not sever the bond between skiers and nature, but it merely recast it. Even in seemingly manufactured landscapes that have been remade to suit the needs of athletes and tourists, the dependence on the natural environment remains constant. A lack of snow can doom a business venture or an international event such as the Olympics. The miracle of Innsbruck, and indeed alpine skiing more generally, demonstrate that nature remains the place that humanity contacts the environment. It's a dynamic relationship, a process that shifts and changes, but it cannot simply be broken or destroyed. And so I think these efforts in 1964 uh, really sort of herald the dawn of a new era in which people are obsessed with so-called snow security. And through snow security, we see winter stations trying to be assured um, that alpine skiers can make reservations, uh, they can pay high prices in an increasingly crowded winter tourism market and know that they will be able to access the slopes when they get there. And on this count, the Alps possess a distinct advantage over other European ski destinations, such as the Pyrenees, because the weather of the Alps is consistently colder, which makes for greater snow security. But the Alps are not a monolithic landscape, as you know, and there's great variation even within the Alps. As we can see from this snow forecast uh, for winter 2019, the southern Alps of France and Italy experience Mediterranean warmth in the fall and the spring, and it shortens their ski season in relationship to the northern Alps by two to four weeks. In contrast, the areas of French Savoie and the Swiss Bernese Oberland enjoy particularly long and reliable ski seasons relatively due to their sustained exposure to cold and wet storms that come in from the Atlantic. Equally important in determining snow security is the elevation of a winter station. 
It's a rather complex map. Uh, that, as you can see here, red shows areas in which the entire resort lies under 1,200 meters. Uh, green, the entire resort is over 1,200 meters, and yellow has a mix, as you can see here. In Austrian Tyrol, a station at 1,800 meters opens on average two weeks earlier and closes on average four weeks later than a station located at 1,200 meters. So that's a six-week difference, which is huge. We're talking about 25% of the season for many of these places. In response, tourism developers seek to invest in station at, excuse me, in, in resorts or stations at ever higher elevations to achieve the highest possible level of snow security. The so-called 100-day rule comes to dominate the ski industry as the various actuaries and insurance folks who invest and, and also insure these resorts agree that a ski area can be viable economically only if it averages at least 100 days of snow coverage per season of somewhere between 30 and 50 centimeters. And so for the companies that invest in and operate ski stations, snow security protects profits and determines where to invest. Unsurprisingly, ski stations are not inclined to leave this up to nature. They begin to produce artificial snow. The invention of the so-called snow cannon in 1950 holds out the promise that nature's so-called deficiencies can be mitigated through human engineering ingenuity. Over the subsequent decades, engineers look to scale this up, and snow cannons begin to be installed widely in the 1980s. And the effects of this are massive. Just one example of this is uh, the resort at Le Weir, which is one of the first to install this in, in uh, sort of large systematic fashion. And they boast that they can produce in the 1980s snow a la carte, right? Uh, so just at will. And they possess an automated system that coordinates 188 separate snow cannons. This process is obviously remarkably resource intensive. It requires a reservoir that contains 53,000 cubic meters of water to keep this going and a central power station that produces over 1,300 kilowatts per hour. The result of this system allows the operators to cover over eight kilometers of ski runs with artificial snow, and thus guarantees snow security, uh, at least in, in less extreme situations, and lengthens the snow, uh, the, the, excuse me, the ski season quite perceptibly. By 2006, approximately 30% of all ski slopes in the Alps could be treated with artificial snow. And at many of the largest and most profitable resorts, that number rises to about 80% of their uh, slopes can be artificially maintained for a short time. And so this image, I think, demonstrates the cumulative effects of all of these things, right? You have lifts to get you higher up where there's more snow. You have the, um, the, the various snow cannons being used uh, to provide for tracks down uh, and with the hope that it's going to be uh, filled in, if we're talking about the fall or the, the early winter, and with the hope that it will keep people coming into April, May, and June as the season stretches out. And so although we should take care to avoid romanticizing previous eras of skiing, contemporary ski pistes are the product of innumerable technological interventions. Um, I'm running a bit short of on time, so I don't want to go into this in any great detail, uh, but this is, I think, a demonstration of what we're talking about here. Groomed ski slopes, uh, fences that prevent people from flying off the edge as they're going around corners, avalanche fencing, lifts, right? All of these things produce the skiing landscape that we know today. In recent decades, the human interventions and the investments in the Alps have become so massive that the alternative economic paths are seemingly impossible to imagine. And so in wide swaths of the Alps, tourism interests have engineered the landscape to ensure the maximum productivity of the ski industry. And the developments that we've been talking about here suggest a certain capitalist tendency to revolutionize the means of production, to streamline and rationalize products and services to render them more profitable. And again, the association between skiing and mass culture only multiplies uh, after World War II. One of my favorites is the uh, use of, of skiing to sell cigarettes. Uh, surrounding the Grenoble Olympics in 1968. Skiing becomes a multi-billion dollar industry after World War II. In the Alps, touristic capitalism alters the material landscape and skiers' perceptions of it. Public and private actors engineer the Alps to suit them and to make the skiing industry and the mountains that it depends on rational, predictable, and profitable. And yet, skiing in the Alps can never be industrialized along idealized principles. There can be no assembly line for a sport that depends on landscapes and on the climate. 
And so although snow cannons covered pieces with manufactured snow, the success of the post-war ski industry remained as dependent on natural conditions as ever before. And this brings us here in January 2020. The question lies whether the further intensification of tourism and the economic development of the highly populated nations of the former third world, will these finally break the Alps? And I think more pressingly, will the undeniable effects of climate change render snow security fanciful, a thing of the past? Climate models suggest that rising temperatures will harm ski areas at lower elevations, below about 1,800 meters, where snow coverage has declined since the 1980s. Meanwhile, resorts at higher elevations will remain viable. But the proportion of resorts with snow security will decline quite significantly. Currently, about 90% of large resorts are, are rated as snow secure. A temperature rise of one degree Celsius, excuse me, Celsius by 2050 would drop snow security to 75%. A two degree rise would drop to 60%. And a four degree rise would render only 30% of Alpine resorts snow secure. At current rates, snow depths in the Alps will be cut in half by the year 2100. And so resorts are preparing for a variety of scenarios. I can go more into these during the discussion section. Um, some of the more famous ones involve covering glaciers with blankets to prevent or slow uh, melting, right? Um, snow cannons are only becoming more important in this process. Um, and now we see one out of every three French resorts and one in two Austrian ones, depending on artificial snow, as part of their normal operations. Not emergency operations, but normal operations. And so I think this is a logical spot to wrap up this lecture for the afternoon. If we think back over this, this history that I've just traced, skiing began as a sport that sought to harmonize modern individuals with nature. But its modern cachet made it uniquely adaptable to mass culture between the two world wars, and it captured the attention of the industrialized world. After World War II, Europe's transition towards service industries and the procession of economic miracles democratized the sport. And in the process, the sport's interventions and the mountain landscape multiplied, with lifts and engineering remaking the mountains into specialized sporting venues. And in its final stage, the immense profit potential of the ski industry led resort operators to manufacture snow a la carte, making both the mountains and weather elements to be managed. And so the question today is whether climate change will eventually eliminate the connection between skiers and the Alps. In fact, in 2017, the Swiss government released a report expressing its confidence that even if winter tourism declined because of lack of snow, that the heating of the Mediterranean coast would make summer vacations in the Swiss Alps more desirable, and thus that things would even out. And so the tourism economy may adapt, but I think the question remains, where will the skier go? Thank you.